been around for a while now, hallelujah. Christ has risen from the grave. You know, and, and just that, that cry, that this, this is the cry of the child of God, not only now but also throughout all eternity. We will be expressing the reality of the work of Christ that has redeemed us and raised us up from the dead. Remember, he is the first fruit of the resurrection. Who, who follows him? Here you are. And throughout history, people have been brought into the family of God. People have been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. People have been in their, in their hearts knowing that as far as God is concerned, we are seated in heavenly places while we may be sitting in a room and all throughout our town of Albany, city of Albany, sorry, through our city of Albany, people are seated in rooms, but in their hearts they know where they are really seated as far as God is concerned, and that is in heavenly places, that is in the presence of the living God. For as God, as far as God is concerned, the deal is done, isn't it? You know, the enemy has been defeated. And I just love that, I love that image. And as I was worshipping, you know, in that song, you know, that, that image of that first morning, resurrection morning, when um, that gradual revelation, that gradual re realization that he has risen, the women making their way towards the tomb in that state of, of utter despair and hopelessness. And, and then that gradual, you know, Mary running to Peter, thinking that the, that the body of the Lord has been stolen. The, the Lord appearing to the women and, and just telling them, you know, why are you looking? Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? He is risen. Go and tell the disciples. And then going to tell the disciples and the disciples in disbelief belief one after another going backwards and forwards from the tomb Peter running into that tomb the Bible tells us he gets there he looks around and it says in his heart he believed we're not told what but there was this revelation that was unfolding something dynamic something life changing was beginning to happen and by the end of that day with the disciples gathered in that upper room there fearing for their lives believing what the women had seen are just nothing but fables and, and the imaginations and the crazed mind of, of despairing people suddenly what happens he appears in the room with them and life changes doesn't it you know, and we see that throughout the history of mankind. We see the Apostle Paul, you know, on the road and suddenly Jesus appears to him and life changes. And that's been happening one on one for thousands of years now, for 2,000 years now. And here we are today. He has appeared to us and life has changed and we cry hallelujah, don't we? And the reason we gather in this place is because of that, but also that we might grow in our knowledge and understanding of God and the wisdom of God that might be imparted to us through giving ourselves to his word. We won't always understand it. I know this morning we're not all going to understand it. We're not all going to agree. But you know, something is going on. Something is happening. God is changing us. God is preparing us for eternity. And the cry of our heart stems right back to 2,000 years ago. What is it? Hallelujah. He's risen from the grave. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It is resonating within our very beings. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. How about that? 2,000 years now, people have been going from all corners of the world to go and see what? To go and see nothing. <laughs> and it stirs their hearts. Because every other religious leader is dust in their grave. But our God has ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and he's promised to come again and receive us unto himself. Hallelujah. Christ has risen, right? Yes. That's the important thing. That's our message to this world. Um, thanks, guys. That was good worship. That was great worship. So um, we're back, aren't we? Again, welcome to visitors. Yes. Um, next week, Sean will be up. Sean will be sharing, God willing, um, about his time in Borneo and what's happening there with the churches that we're connected to and uh, that you have been supporting. Uh, it will be encouraging. Um, and we're back. We're gradually getting ready, school starts or has started for some, um, holidays are ending, are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? Yeah, <laughs> there goes a dad, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, 
And God is good. That means we are back in the book of Romans. That's what that means. We've had a break. So if you will turn with me. And um, we are starting our year in Romans in the ninth chapter. Um, get, get excited about the camp, will you? You know, please. No, do. I know you will. I'm, you know, I'm excited because we got our long weekend back. You know, for years we had the, this long weekend. Uh, we had three days at camp and it was just the greatest time. And um, we lost it for a few years, but now it's ours again. We won't give it up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, get, get registered. Get online. Do what you need to do. Um, if you have any troubles about registration, let us know. We, we don't want, we, we want everybody there. So, um, all right. I watched a movie last. No, I didn't actually. I was in my. Um, as you turn to chapter nine, I was in my. I was in my. Uh, it was in the in the in the study, and I came up and I came and sat in the lounge. The television on, but was on, but the but the sound was off. And so I'm not sure what the movie was, but as I as I sat down, I looked and and I was doing some reading, and there's this scene where there's this fellow there. And it's obviously some sort of medieval warrior type movie. Um, and there's a fellow there and he's standing there like this. And he's looking up at the heavens and there's this, in his eyes, there's this great, there's this great sense of relief. You can see it. He is, he's just, he's, he's at rest, right? And then, then I notice that what is coming towards him is a thousand flaming arrows, and he's just like this as the arrows are coming. And they go all over him, all past him, everywhere around him. And they're landing behind him. And then they cease. And he's still standing there. And he's still smiling. And he opens his eyes. And he says some words. I don't know what he said. But it was the sense of, uh, you know, today's not my day. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that was about. <laughs> But there was a sense in that rest and that peace that he had was that there was somebody in control. And there was a day, the day that God had ordered. And in that, you know what I saw? I, I don't know. I, there's, there's a picture of God's sovereignty in that, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's some Hollywood movie. Did anybody, was any, does anybody know what it was that was on my telly last night? You know? <laughs> I want to find out now. But anyway... Um, God's sovereignty, that's the issue of John, of Romans chapter 9. Now here's the thing, let me bring you up to speed. This book of Romans, you, you, know, you know, it's one of, it is, for me, it is the book. As you've heard me say, it's the greatest book within the greatest book. You know? And probably Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter within the greatest book within the greatest book. Isn't that right? And, there are, and, and, and the reason for that is because what's, what God was doing uh, through the Apostle Paul, he was bringing us to this incredible place of comfort and rest in who God is and what God has done within our lives. You know, in those first few chapters, what God was doing, remember this, let me bring you up to speed. What God was doing was he was bringing the reality that all of humanity is guilty before a holy, righteous God. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. None is righteous. No, not one. Remember those verses? You know, and all of humanity, doesn't matter if you're a Jew, doesn't matter if you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter. Everybody is guilty. Why? Because we are born into this world fallen. We are born sinners. We don't become sinners. We come into this world as sinners because, as it tells us in the fifth chapter of Romans, that our federal head, that is Adam, who fell, brought sin into this perfect creation, and he passed on to his progeny, you and I, that which he had to give. And what did he have to give? He had to give to us a fallen nature. So we're all born with sin. Paul is unfolding this in those early chapters, and then he begins to speak about this wonderful justification that God has worked through faith. 
That as Christ has come as the perfect one, he has come, he has laid down his life as a sacrifice for you and I. And have our faith in him, because of our faith in him, the finished work that he has done, we can be justified. That is, we can be made just, we can be made perfect, we can be made as if we have never sinned at all because of what Christ has done for us. And now we are veiled in the robes of Christ's righteousness. Heaven is our promise. And we arrive at Romans chapter 8 and we get really, really really excited because it starts to talk about this absolute confidence that we have because we have been called, we have been justified, we have been glorified, we have been predestined according to his foreknowledge and, you, and then you hear that and you read that and just as that cry of that song that we were singing, you know, he has risen from the dead, the reason that is such a wonderful cry is because we can now recognize that God has saved us and if God be for us, what is it? Who can be against us? It's this incredible confidence that comes in Romans chapter 8 to the point where it closes out. Do you remember this? Look what can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, right? And so he's declaring this, this incredible confidence. God has called us. When did he call us? He called us in eternity past before the foundations of the world, Ephesians tells us. He called us, he, sorry, he chose us then, he called us, he again justified us, and as Romans chapter 8 says, he has glorified us in the sense that as far as God is concerned, this is where I started, the job is done. We're in heaven as far as God is concerned, and that is incredible confidence, isn't it? And so now as Paul leaves the heights of Romans chapter 8, he ends, enter, enters into Romans chapter 9, and there is a question that he is preempting. And here it is. If our great confidence is based upon the promises of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ, then what about the promises that God made to the nation Israel? What about those promises? Didn't God promise them? And yet they had rejected their Messiah. And the question is, God has, has God cast them away? And if he has done that, then what confidence can we truly have? You know, one of the questions of chapter 9 is, has God's word failed? Because of what happened to Israel, you know? And so, can we trust this justification is the question that he's answering. And Paul's going to say, well, of course we can, because that's really, it's not really what it's all about. It's not about Israel failing and Israel rejecting their Messiah, because when we get to chapter 12, we're going to start talking about human responsibility. And then we get to chapter, 11, sorry, chapter 10, then we get to chapter 11, we're going to talk about Israel's purpose and plan for his nation. No, he has not cast his people away. No, he has not. And so this is where it starts. This is the question. Is our confidence sure and can it be rocked by what the reality of what we see has happened in and through the nation Israel? Paul is saying, no, they're in God's hands. God has a purpose yet to be fulfilled, right? So they were unbelieving. They were bitterly antagonistic. They, they persecuted the church. Paul himself was one of them, persecuting the church, you know. And Paul enters into this whole question with this heart. You know what this heart is? It's this heart of, of just incredible burden for that nation. And, and he just wants to, you can hear him, you can hear it in him. We better read some scripture, hadn't we? <laughs> Yeah, so let, let me. So this is this is where look at this, read those first five verses, as Paul launches into this issue of sovereignty. That's how he addresses that whole thing, you know, looking at the sovereignty of God. He says, "I tell you the truth, in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit." He says, "Then I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart." For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh who are Israel, to whom pertain, notice this is the promises to them, who pertain the adoption, the glory of the covenant, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came who is over all 
the eternal blessed God, and he says, Amen. So here's the Apostle Paul. You know, it, it's an impossible thing, isn't it, that, that he's trying to say here. You know, he's looking at the, the nation Israel. He's seeing his brethren that have rejected Christ. He recognized that he was once one of them, and, and his heart is so burdened that he says, Hey, I could, if I could exchange, you know, if, if I could give my salvation, essentially is what he is saying, but it's the intensity of his love that, that they might be one, that they might be saved to Christ. And this hurt is just intensified by this awareness that God has given them these incredible privileges. Again, Israel was adopted by God to be his peculiar people from all the nations of the world. You know, God gave them his glory. He revealed his glory to them. God made covenants with them. And of course, the greatest of all of the promises is that God promised that through that nation would the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come into this world. Paul was so proud, and it's important that we highlight this because he was so proud of his heritage, but it hurt him to realize that his people had missed Christ, who was the culmination of all of those promises that God made to his people. They missed it. Now... And I think this would include all of us. We can get a sense of this because you know, most of us have got unsaved loved ones, don't we? You know, we've got unsaved loved ones. And, and it gives us an inkling into what this hurt was that Paul was carrying in his heart, you know. You know, you love them, right? You, you, you love them. You enjoy them, you stand with them, you laugh with them, you play with them, you are there to support them in their time of need, you will never ever abandon them, but underneath that there is this ache within your heart, but why won't they come to Christ? Now, why won't they come to Christ? And Paul's heart is just aching like that for Israel, for his nation. And he bears this incredible burden. And he has this incredible hunger to see them saved. You know, it kind of reminds me of Jesus when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Remember that story? You know, he, get that, he came in and he stopped on the Mount of Olives and he overlooked the city. And we're told that he stopped and he wept. Why? He wept because he said, if you had known, especially in this your day, the things that are here to make for your peace, if only you know. Paul, with the same Christ-like burden, willing to give up even his salvation, but at the same time, he knows that's impossible. Because Christ, that's what Christ has come to do, right? Christ is the only one who could give life for life, because Christ is the only one who is the giver of life. He's the only one who innately has life within him to give. Every life we have has been given to us. Isn't that right? But Christ, the giver of life, laid down his life that we might experience life eternal. So Paul is saying something. This is just a burden. This is just a cry of my heart. We saw the same thing in Moses, didn't we? We saw the same thing in Moses when he pleaded for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai when they had, re when they had rejected the worship of God by worshipping a golden calf, you know. But they refused to believe. And it's with this ache in his heart that the Apostle Paul addresses God's plan for Israel over the next three chapters. And again, it's about sovereignty today. And so here's again, is the, here is the argument. So if God failed to keep his promise to Israel, then how do we know that he's going to keep his promise to us, the church, has God's promise, has God's word fail? And so Paul in chapter 9, what he's doing, he's, in a sense, he's defending the character of God. And this is a hard thing. This is a really, really hard chapter for a lot of people. Because Paul's defense of God, his character, is based upon the fact that God is God and he has a right to choose. It's called the election. Now remember this, election. See, this is the thing. People get upset about election because they say, well, God doesn't have a right to choose. But at the same time, Christian believer, election is the very thing that gives you your confidence. Isn't that right? In chapter 8, he chose you, he called you. 
And that's why we quote Romans 8.28. What does he say? He says, we know all things work together for who? For those who love God. Why? Well, because, and here in this is election, for those who love God. Why? Because this is election. They are called according to what? To his purpose. For when, for whom he foreknew, he went on to say, we remember these verses, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? To conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these all present tense, he has glorified. This is election. That's election. Now, it brings great confidence For me? What about you? Knowing that you are the child of God? Knowing that he'll never leave you? He'll never abandon you? Knowing that? But it's trouble for some people, isn't it? It's trouble for some people. Now, here's the thing. I've got to say this. Um, So what's Chris doing here? What's Chris saying here? Is Chris a Calvinist? Is Chris preaching Calvinism here? No, he's not. No, he's not. We get to the next chapter and we're going to read words like, For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, throughout the scripture, there's over and over again, there is great great emphasis upon a responsibility that falls upon a child of God. Jesus himself said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus himself said, Hey, you take up the... There's a word in my head. (laughs) You take up the plow and you don't look back. Emphasizing again the great responsibility that we have to pursue God, to seek God. And even in the next chapter, we're going to find where it starts to talk about the beautiful feet of those who bring the gospel. And it's basically saying if there's no people to bring the gospel, how might people be saved? So there's great responsibility. Now, I'm not here saying that Calvinism is the way or Arminianism is the way. Now, what I'm here to say is that God is sovereign. That's what I'm here to say. God is a sovereign God. And next week, we're going to be talking about human responsibility. And after that, we're going to be talking about God's restoration of the nation Israel and their purpose being fulfilled. So you don't box me. (laughs) Don't box people. But read the scripture. Yes, God's sovereignty is taught. Yes, human responsibility is taught. And if anybody says they have got it worked out completely to be one end of the, one end of the, of, of the story or the other end of the story, I tell you they're liars. Because there are things about God we don't understand, right? Isn't that right? Just a few things, isn't that? Just one or two. No, no, no. What's he doing? He's holding up Israel. This is what the chapter is about. He's holding up Israel as an example of God's election. And he will point to the choices that God has made in establishing the nation. And he's saying, that's okay. We've already read it, haven't we, about the adoption of the nation, that they were adopted nationally. That started, God elected them. He went to a place called Ur of the Chaldees and he found this Chaldean man worshipping pagan gods and, he, and according to the New Testament it says God appeared unto this man. Who was that? It was Abram, wasn't it? Who would be, name would be changed to Abraham. God chose him. He was elected and from him a nation grew, a nation was born. And again, as it said, God revealed his glory to that nation. Certainly we saw that in the deliverance of the children of Israel from from the Egyptian bondage. And certainly we saw that in the tabernacle when God's glory, the Shekinah glory of God established there before their very presence. He made covenants with them. There was a covenant with Abraham. There was a covenant with Moses. There was a covenant with David and so on. He gave them his law on Sinai. He gave them the sacrificial system. He gave them the temple service. And to them he gave the greatest promise, the promise of Messiah. They were a nation that is elected by God for his sovereign purposes. And again, the election of God, while hard for some to receive, is being held up here in this chapter to support, as support for the confidence that we can have, 
and the fact that God has chosen us and that his word has not failed. He will not abandon his people. Don't you like that? He will not abandon his people, his elect people. And so he's going to go. I just want to plough through this. I'm probably taking too much time here. But I just want to plough through this. Sorry, that's the wrong word, isn't it? Let's just make our way through this <laughs> and see the examples and he be, that he gives of God's election. He begins with uh, Abraham's sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And uh, so let's just read that. He says, but in verse 6, it is not that the word of God has, take, has taken no effect. No, it hasn't failed. For they are not all Israel who are saved. Who are, so they're not all Israel, who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But here's the example. But in Isaac your seed shall be called, that is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will, this is what God promised Abraham, I shall come to Sarah, she shall have a son. So what he says here is that the word of God, no, it has not failed. And right away he begins to give this example of God's election between two sons. He says, not all the descendants of Abraham, talking about the Jewish people, are Israel. Why? Because in Isaac, he says, your seed shall be called. His first son was Ishmael, wasn't he? Remember? But Ishmael was not the son of promise. Ishmael was not the son of faith. Because remember, the promise came to Abraham. And for 25 years, Abraham waited for that promise to be fulfilled in faith, trusting that God would bring this promised child who would be who would be the promised fulfillment. But in that 25 years, um, Sarah got impatient, didn't she? And of course, Ishmael was born. And so he is not the son. So the issue here is of faith, one of the flesh and one of the faith, trusting what God has promised or trying to work it out yourself. Ishmael was born not to... Oh, why is my brain not working? Sarah, thank you. <clears throat> but to Hagar, his maidservant. And so when God tests the faith of Abraham, remember what he said to him? Genesis chapter 22, one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. He said, take your son, your only son. Your only son. See, Ishmael was about 14 years old. No, he was much older than that. He was about 14 years younger. Older, sorry. Oh, get it right, Chris. 14 years older than Isaac at that time. But God rejected Ishmael because he had what? He had elected. He had chosen Isaac. So there's your first example. Now he moves forward. Are you good with that? You see the election there? And so he moves forward now. He said, not only this verse 10, but he says, when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, that the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Contentious verse, right? But now again, before that, we look at that contentious verse, God's sovereign election is very clear, isn't it? Because here's the thing. Here are two boys. We know the story of Jacob and Esau. Two twins... Same mother, same father, right? Now Esau was born, born first. And if, and, if he should have, and if there should be any priority given, especially in the Jewish culture, certainly that priority should have been given to him on the grounds of being born first. 
Esau should have had that priority, but what did God do? He said, the older shall serve the younger. Every Jew knew that this was just another example of God's election. And it was, here's the thing, it was not based upon, you've got to understand this, it was not based upon any human virtue or any good work that either of them had done. Why? Why? Because the twins weren't born, remember? They were not even born when God made his choice. It was based upon God's sovereign elected choice. It was based upon God's divine elective purposes. Now, here's the thing. The verse upsets, enrages many people, actually, you know, because of the fact that it says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And they say, well, that's just not fair. It's not fair that God can make that choice even before they were born. But here's the thing. When that was said, when God brought that truth forward in Malachi chapter 1, it's referring not to the individual's Jacob nor the individual's Esau, but rather it's referring to the nationalities that they became. It's talking about the nations of Israel and Edom. And Edom, by that time, Malachi chapter 1 was spoken, Edom had were a perennial enemy of Israel, weren't they? And so when God says, Jacob I, I have loved, but Esau I have hated, he's talking about a national aspect in that Israel were his chosen ones for his chosen purpose, Ishmael had become this son of the flesh who was a, who was, um, a, you know, a, a thorn to the nation Israel. And by the time David came along, in fact, um, Edom, Edom were in servitude to the, to the Hebrew people. They had become their slaves. And that is, that, is, that is dealt with in Genesis when Jacob dies. And I'm sort of I'm digressing here because I want you to understand. When he says God has hated Esau, it's not how you and I view hatred. Because when we say someone hates someone, we think about it with malice, don't we? You know, there's malice and there's, there's, there's just anger and burns within us towards someone. Malice wants to see somebody hurt, right? But now what he's doing, he's using this strong expression by way of comparison to declare God's elective choice to Israel. Jesus did the same thing. He used the same language when he talked about us as believers following him. You know, you go back to Luke's gospel. He says we must, remember these words? He says we must hate their father. If you want to follow him, hate your father and mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sister, even the sister, your sisters, even their own lives. What did he say? Or you cannot be my disciples. What is he saying? He's not saying you've got to with malice hate your parents, hate your siblings. No, no, no. What he's saying is the love that you will have towards me. The love that you will have towards me will far outweigh any human experience of love that you can know in this world. Because he dies for you. He brought you eternal life. And so scripture and history declare that God's elective purpose was to raise up this nation through Abraham, Jacob, sorry, Isaac, Jacob, not Esau, not Esau, and to pour out his love upon that nation, Israel, in order to bring a saviour into this world for all humanity. The whole point is this. No, God's word has not failed because Israel failed. That's the point of it. You know, God could have chosen Esau, couldn't he? Couldn't he? And his elective purposes... If he wanted to accomplish it through Esau, God had the right. He is God. You see, people that say that God's not allowed to be sovereign are really taking the very, very base nature of what God is. You know, if you're not sovereign, then you're not God. It's that simple. He is sovereign. You know, the truly amazing thing about this is when you stop and think about it, hey, because you know Esau and Jacob's story, the truly amazing thing is it's a wonder he chose either of them. You know, because they were both scoundrels, both of them. And isn't that the same for you and I? 
Is it a wonder that he he chose me? Is it a wonder that he chose you? It's amazing that God has chosen any of us. That's where our amazement should be. Not that he chooses, but that he chose us. So verse 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not, he says. Is God unfair? That's what it is. Certainly not. The thing is this. If we say that God cannot be fair and be a God who elects or chooses, as I said to you a moment ago, then we've got a completely wrong concept of who God is. See, I can say this. Any of us can do this. We can say, I choose this or I choose that. We can say, I choose one over another. And you can say, that's unfair to me. Right. You know, I could well be right. I could well be wrong. I could, it could well be unfair. You can say that to me. But here's the thing. We cannot apply that to God. We can't view God simply as an enlarged person with human emotions and human motives or responses. No, God is infinite. Think about it. If this troubles you, God is infinite. We are finite, you know. And if he is not sovereign, as I said to you a moment ago, then he's not God at all. Stop. Think. God knows all things from the beginning to the end. Our knowledge, your knowledge, my knowledge, it is miserable and it's incomplete at its very best. Therefore, we cannot enter into the reasoning of God and know why he does things the way that he does them. But the fact is this, God is perfect. God is perfect in his knowledge, he's perfect in his wisdom, in his power, in his faithfulness, in his goodness, in his justice, in his grace, his love and his holiness. Therefore, his choices are perfect, always. I don't question it. I don't have any problem with election at all. I don't question it. I just thank God he chose me. I thank God he chose me. For reality, I know I've said this, but nobody deserves to be saved. And God will be totally justified in destroying all of humanity for all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. None is righteous, no, not any. I mean, God could dismiss us all like that and no one could hold a charge of unfairness against him. God is completely and totally justified in making that decision if he chose to, but he didn't. That's the amazing thing about God. God in his grace... And this should stir your heart. Has chosen to redeem some. And we can't accuse him of being unfair. No, we can't. He's perfectly holy and righteous. So Paul continues with this point to vindicate the character of God. And he says in verse 15, and now he's going to Moses. For he says... To Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. You know, that was said to Moses after that, uh, that account of idolatry. You go back to Genesis chapter 32 and 33 when Moses was up in Sinai receiving the commandments of God and he came down. And remember, there was rumbling down in the camp. They'd made a golden calf. In fact, you know, I think they thought that Moses was dead. He'd been up there for 40 days and 40 nights, you know. And so they, they said to Aaron, make us a god. What an incredible moment in their history this is. Make us a god. To, see, they said, he said, make us an image to worship the god who brought us out of Egypt. You know. And so they all got their gold, and this is what this is was Aaron's story when when this is Aaron's story when uh, when Moses got back. You know, we got all this gold, we threw it all together in the furnace, and this calf jumped out. And so we decided to worship it. You know, uh, idolatry is foolishness, isn't it? It's amazing what people worship and how they'll justify it when they reject the true and the living God. It's just amazing what people will do and what they will say. You know, it just jumped out. No, and so God. 
prior to that, says to Moses, hey, there's something going on down there. Something going on down there, you know. But God didn't destroy them. You know, there's this whole debate going on. It's this wonderful story. It's this wonderful account where, you know, God says, your people down there, you better get down there and see what they're doing. Your people, Moses, your people, God. <laughs> you know, they don't mind. And there's this little, no one wants to take ownership for them, you know. But God could have ended it right there and then. But the next, after that episode, you know, Moses just wanting to know, he just wants to know God. He wants to, he says, I just want to see, I just want to see your glory. And, and that's when God says to him, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. You know, he bestows mercy and compassion on whoever he wants. He is the sovereign God. I can't fault him for that. I know I'm repeating myself, but if again, all deserve destruction and we do, I can't fault God for showing me mercy and compassion on my life and on your life. That's the true question. Again, why me? He's merciful. Keep reading with me. Verse 17. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh. Now we're back with Pharaoh. For this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he will have and whom he wills he hardens. So I've raised up Pharaoh for this purpose, he says. Now, Pharaoh is an example of God's elective purposes. He was this godless man. We know the story, don't we? He was this godless man that deserved God's judgment, yet God allowed him to go on in his rejection of God's purpose for Israel so that he could reveal his power to God's people, to deliver them. Now we could say, well, God, that's unjust, that you could use a person like that. You could say that's unfair for God hardened Pharaoh's heart in order to do or bring about that purpose. Well, Paul hasn't given us the whole story here. We should know the whole story. So, Because in Exodus, we read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart against God's word. God said to Moses, you go down and you tell Pharaoh to let my people go. You know the story, right? And Pharaoh said no. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Twenty times that word is used. Ten times of Pharaoh saying it, another ten times of God saying it. But you know, each time he rejected God's command, he was hardening his heart against God's purpose here. Hardening his heart against God's purpose. And Pharaoh said, no, I won't listen to this God. In fact, he said, who is God, this God that I should obey him? That's a hard heart, isn't it? You know? And we read that Pharaoh did this over and over and over again, stealing, hardening his own heart against God. And then we read, and then we read that God hardened his heart, or God, actually it's like this, God made firm that which Pharaoh had already done. Let me ask you, is it fair for God to make firm the decisions that we repeatedly make? Is that unfair? You know, if I'm determined... And I can say this to every one of you here as I say it to myself. If I am determined not to accept God's forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ, can I then blame God for not saving me? Certainly not. If I don't want to be around God's people, if I don't want to be around God, if I don't want to be in the presence of a holy, righteous God for all eternity, then why should God force himself upon me and drag me kicking and screaming into heaven if I don't want it? Is that fair? To you, that's not fair. Doing something against my will. You don't want me? Pharaoh said, I don't want you. I'm not interested in what you tell me to do. And ultimately, God allowed that which was happening in his own heart to become firm. So he says in verse 19... 
you will say to me, then why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply again with God? Who are you to argue with God? This is another human reasoning. Why does God find fault in those that have resisted his will? Well, you could put it this way. Hey, I am what God made me. I can't resist his will, so it's not fair for God to judge me. That's the argument, you know. As I said, human reasoning, that's what that is. And so Paul responds by asking, who are we to question God? The issue is, who are we to argue with God, right? One commentator said, if you argue with God, you're going to find out you're wrong. It's that simple. But whatever argument you've got going on right now with God, the existence of God, the purpose of God, the reality of his salvation and what he wants to do in your heart, if you're arguing against it, you are going to be revealed to be wrong. Because he is sovereign. right? He is sovereign. right? Who are we to stand before him? That's, that's the rationale. Who are we to stand before him? The God who knows everything from the beginning. The God, stop and think about it. The God who never learned anything because he knows everything. The God who is the perfection of wisdom and love. Who are we to talk back to him? To argue with him? Now Job tried that, didn't he? You know the story of Job? In the midst of Job's sufferings, his friend Elihu comes to him you know, with long-winded speeches as to, to why Job was in the difficult suffering and the difficult position that he was in. And Job himself chimes in on it, you know. And, and, and that's when God replies. You know, I love, this is one of my favourite verses in the entire Bible. Job chapter 38, he says, Who is this? who darkens counsel by words without knowledge. He says, now you prepare yourself as a man and I will question you and you will answer me. Isn't that just... Who are we? Tiny man? Who are we with our limited understanding? What do I know about anything? The only thing I know is what I can see with my five cents, see, smell, hear, with, with my senses, right? I have no understanding of what's going on inside people's hearts, minds. No understanding what their motivations are. No understanding of what they've been through this day, that day, or any other time. I have no understanding. Who am I? And that's with mankind. So who am I to think that I can question God who knows all? It's a good question, isn't it? And so he says in verse 20, but indeed, O oh man, who, I'm nearly done now, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing form same to him who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? So now he brings in this image of the potter. Making clay vessels. Does the clay ever speak up and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you making me into here? Wait a minute. Why are you doing it this way? Wait a minute. No, does the potter have the right to make, to shape as he sees fit? Of course he does. Of course he does. Now the clay of mankind, of course, is sinful, isn't it? Through and through. Every one of us, again, has rebelliously resisted God. And so, again, the question should be, why are some of us made, to dis not to dishonor, but why are some of us chosen for honor? Because I know I don't deserve salvation. Have I said that enough times this morning? I know I don't. But the bottom line is, God is not answerable to me or to you for what he does. Now, again... This position, I think, can create, well, great rest. As I said, I believe that's what Paul is doing. Or it can bring great fear. You know why? It all depends upon the character and the nature of who God is. 
No, God has absolute authority to make you as he wills. Wouldn't that be a frightening thing if you didn't know what his character was? If you didn't know what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe on him will not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Why would I fear such a God? Why would I fear such a God? Why would I question such a God? Why? No. Let's read this. Well, what if God, verse 22, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known endures with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? You know, sometimes we wonder why is God withholding judgment against the ungodly? You know, what if he does it? This is the question. What if he's doing it to show his power as he did with Pharaoh, right? We see it again. We see it all over the place, but we see it again when God told Abraham that his descendants, remember this? God told his, 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 that his descendants in Genesis chapter 15, that they would be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And that they would be afflicted 400 years, he says. But he says, in the fourth generation, they shall return. That is, go into the land of promise. Why? He says, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet been fulfilled. The Amorites were the inhabitants of Canaan, the promised land. And when God said to Abraham, he says, your inhabitants are not going to come into the promised land for another 400 odd years. Why? Because those living in the promised land, their iniquity has not yet been fulfilled. In other words, there was work yet to be done. In other words, God was going to allow that iniquity to bring about his purposes because he's going to bring his people into that land of promise. We see the same thing with the Babylonians. God allowed the Babylonians to rise up and he rose that nation up under Nebuchadnezzar to come in to do what? To invade Israel, to take the Jewish people captive, to bring them into captivity for 70 years. Why? Because what did God want to do? God needed to get that idolatry out of them and bring them back into the land. And he used them. He used, we allowed the wickedness to go on in order to bring about his glory in his people. Do you see it? Do I have a right to question that? That's what Paul is saying. He said, look at verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared before for glory. Look, I don't know if you've tracked with me well this morning and and I knew this was going to be hard, but this is what God has done for you. He's chosen you as a, mess, as a vessel of mercy to, to reveal his mercy to you. And now what he's doing, he's molding you and he is shaping you and he's preparing you to experience his glory. His glory. Now look, I'm out of time. The remainder of the chapter continues to speak of God's elective purposes. He's going to go back into the Old Testament He's going to look at prophecy from Hosea and Isaiah. And in those prophecies, he's going to speak about how God is going to extend his mercy, his salvation to the Gentile world. And through Isaiah, he's going to talk about how God, again, is going to call a remnant of Israel to be saved. We're going to see that in chapter 11 of of Romans. But the whole chapter emphasizes the truth that God is sovereign and God chooses where he wills. The next chapter, as I said to you, chapter 10, is going to be bring back the, the, the perspective of human responsibility that we are to respond to the call that uh, God places upon our hearts. And so uh, I, I've got one question this morning. Because you might say, well, why did I come to church this morning for that? You know, 
And you might say, well, I disagree completely. You might say, I don't understand any of that. Well, that's fine because I don't think we can. I can't reconcile God's sovereignty with human responsibility. My mind can't do it. I can try and jump through all sorts of hoops and sort of reason out something, but at the end of the day, I can't do it. So I rest in his sovereignty, knowing that he has called me to be responsible to his word and to his calling upon my life. That's where I leave it. So my my question to you this morning is, do you know that God has chosen you? That's my question. Wonderful. I really hope there'd be more than one yes in a room with this many people in it. But hey, if you're here this morning and you don't know that God has chosen you, then guess what? Guess what you need to do? You know what you need to do? Because he's going to tell us in the next chapter. If anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Here's my promise to you this morning. If you don't know, if you don't feel that God has chosen you, just call upon his name. And you'll discover that heaven isn't close to anyone. It's not close to anyone. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, I think you're here this morning because God's Spirit is working within your life. That's why I think you're here this morning. It's not got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with anything I say. But it's got everything to do with who God is and what God says. And God says that. He's not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to salvation. That's all of you. If you don't know it. Look, if you are one of these stubborn people that's going, well, that's not fair. I don't like a God like that. That's not fair. Well, my question to you is, how do you know that God hasn't chosen you? How do you know? Well, I don't want to believe. Well, maybe he didn't choose you then. (laughs) Well, that's not fair. That's not fair. I don't want this life to be the end of it. I don't want to be swept away into eternity and not know what... No, that's not fair. Well... Choose him. Ask him to forgive you. And you will discover, you will discover that you have been chosen by God before the foundations of this world were laid. And you will find great comfort and great rest. No matter how many days God has got for you left on this planet, you need to know that you are secure in his love and his mercy. You need to know that because the threshold is coming and we're going to step over it into his presence or not. And I have great confidence. Do you? Yes. Amen. Shall we worship this God one more time? If you've got any questions about this, I probably don't have the answer. <laughs> but I can certainly tell you how to be saved. Just as anybody in this room can tell you how to be saved. The person sitting next to you would love to pray with you. would love to encourage you in the things of God. And the rest of eternity will begin this day. If you would just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with yourself. Be my Lord. Lead me. I love you, Lord. Thank you for this great gift. Amen. What a prayer that is. That's a prayer that has changed this world over and over and over again. Pray it if you haven't.